Welcome to Through the Bible. Today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us to 1 Samuel chapter 31 as he unravels the mystery of who killed King Saul. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus. And if you're just joining us and you want to listen to all of Dr. McGee's messages in 1 Samuel, which is a great idea, by the way, visit ttb.org Samuel, where you can listen online for free and also read or download all the study helps on 1 and 2 Samuel. Or just call us anytime at 1-800-65-BIBLE and we can help you out. Now, we got a lot of ground to cover today, so let's pray to get the Bible bus rolling. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. Would you help us to not only hear your truth, but to believe it and to live it in our lives as well? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come to this last chapter of 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at the question of who killed King Saul. And here is a case where probably we ought to turn it over to the FBI because there seems to be some question here as who is responsible for his death. Now, will you notice, I begin reading at verse 1, the Israelites are in battle with the Philistines. And thank the Lord, David was not engaged in that battle. The providence of God, God intervened to keep him from entering that battle. And so David had withdrawn, gone back to Ziklag, found the tragedy that had taken place there, and he'd gone after the Amalekites who had destroyed and burned the city and taken the people captive. Now we find that in verse 1, the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And every time that you find the Israelites fleeing before their enemies, it's because they're out of the will of God, because they're going against God. Now, this idea today that God approved a war in the Old Testament, he did not at all. And when Israel would engage in a war outside of the will of God, when they're not defending themselves, then they generally lost the battle. And that's what happened here. Now we're told in verse 2, and here's where the tragedy begins for the Israelites. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was so wounded of the archers. Now it would seem that the beginning of the end of Saul, of course, is here. He's first hit in battle by an archer. Apparently, it was by someone who did not recognize that he had hit the king. It was a real, shall we say, a real bullseye, and he had hit the king. The tragedy that is here, of course, is that Jonathan is slain here in this battle. And this is remarkable because we read on one occasion that Jonathan slew 250 of the enemy, and they were Philistines at one time. So it reveals how hopelessly outnumbered Israel was now. And this could well have been a battle in which David and Jonathan would have been on opposite sides. God had intervened. My David felt badly that he couldn't go into the battle, you know. Well... He didn't recognize at the time that God had intervened on his behalf. And many times our disappointments are his appointments, as someone has neatly put it. All right, now we find here that this man Saul is wounded. Now what happens? Verse 4, Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not. Now when Saul saw that he was mortally wounded, he felt that the enemy would come and get him and taunt him. And I think they would have. And also, he did not want to be slain like this in battle. Saul was a very, as we've seen, a very proud, egotistical man. And this was something that just wasn't becoming to him at all. 
Now we're told his armor bearer would not. He was afraid to do this, to lay hand upon the king. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. Now it would look as if Saul was a suicide. Was he a suicide now? Well, we'll find out. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head, stripped off his armor, and sent him to the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And you begin to see now, with this armor being sent around, of why Saul tried to get David to wear his armor out to fight Goliath. The whole point was that had David won with the armor of Saul, who would have taken credit for the battle? Well, we know. We know that Saul would have because when his own son got a victory, and instead of giving his son credit for it, he blew the trumpet in the land and he took credit for it. Now will you notice, they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night, took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the walls of Bethshan, and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. They took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now, we come actually now to the end of 1 Samuel. And somebody says, well, there wasn't such a mystery about the death of Saul. You seem to think there was quite a mystery. Well, we're not actually through with this yet. In 2 Samuel, we'll pick it up. But now we have the death of Saul recorded here at the end of 1 Samuel. And we now can come to some sort of conclusions. First of all, Saul failed in ruling God's property. And the end here is self-destruction as far as 1 Samuel is concerned. And God and his authority are rejected. And this is a dark day for the nation Israel. And isn't it interesting? We are going to find out that Saul spared the Amalekites and Samuel rebuked him for it and said, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God wants obedience, and this man's heart was never bowed to Almighty God. And now we're going to find out Saul was actually killed by the Amalekites. Now somebody says, but we've already had the record that the Philistines did it. An archer shot him, and he was mortally wounded, and he tried to get his armor bearer to kill him, and he would not and he fell on his own sword. Isn't that the explanation? And this is a closed case, is it not, for the police department of Beth Shan? I don't think so. Now, Second Samuel, that we're coming to now, opens on a note that we need to note very well, and I did not mean to make such an ugly pun at that point. This book, by the way, that we're entering now of Second Samuel, it's full of David as the New Testament is full of Christ. It's given over entirely to the reign of King David. And we find in 1 Kings some records of the few declining years and death of David, but we have the life and times of David here in 2 Samuel, and they are important because he is the ancestor of Jesus, and he's the type of the Lord Jesus as king, and also, friends, he's a great king, a great man, and we can learn many spiritual lessons from him. And also the book of Psalms was largely composed by David 
out of the experiences of his life that are recorded here. And again, that makes this all important for us, by the way. Now we're going to meet many new characters in this book. And they are characters that you and I ought to get acquainted with. And we're going to have now, in the first ten chapters, the triumphs of David. And they're going to be wonderful, by the way. And then we're going to come to the troubles of David, chapters 11 through 24. And they were innumerable, and they were a result of his sin. Don't tell me that God's people or David got by with sin and that God did not rebuke him and judge him for his sin. All right, now that brings us here to chapter 1, and I still have the question, who killed King Saul? We'll bring another suspect before us, even if it doesn't answer the question. So let's look at this. Now it came to pass, after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent, earth upon his head, and so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. Now this is the picture. This is a dark day in the nation Israel. War came to these people. And friends, when these people are in war, when they're having their troubles like this, it's because they're out of the will of God. I'm not sure that one of the reasons that we thought at the end of World War II we'd brought peace in the world, and we expected to rest on our laurels and enjoy life in sin far from God, because that's the way the United States moved after World War II. And you know something? We haven't had a day of peace since the war ended. It's just been continual war for us. I wonder if maybe there might be a lesson here for us that a nation or a people or an individual will have turmoil. There'll be warfare. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah said that three times. I wonder if that might not be applicable to us today. This was a dark day for Israel. And you can see the position they're in. King Saul is dead. Jonathan and the other sons of Saul are dead. They have lost the battle. The Philistines have taken all that northern area around Galilee. And now here in the south, David didn't even know what had happened in the battle. He's been down recovering his own people from the Amalekites, and he's come back to Ziklag. He's been there two days not having word, and finally here comes a man all disheveled, covered with mud and dirt and rent clothes, and he stumbles into the camp and he says, I've come from the war and the Philistines have won and King Saul is dead. But now he tells something that's quite interesting here. Listen to him. David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son are dead? And the young man that told him said, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. He said unto me, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither 
unto my Lord. Now this Amalekite, did he actually come upon the body of Saul, find him dead, and then took the crown and these marks of the king, these things that he wore, and bring them to David? Or did he actually come upon Saul, and Saul was not yet dead? I'm of the opinion that when Saul fell upon his sword, that he still was not dead, that there was life in him. And when this Amalekite came by, he asked him to slay him, and the Amalekite did it. And the interesting thing, he comes and confesses it to David, and he expects David to give him a medal for it and put him on a life pension. And notice what happened, though. David took hold on his clothes, ran him, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. Now you see, if this man did slay Saul, then Saul, when he disobeyed God in not slaying all the Amalekites, he let them go made a big mistake because this is the man who slew him, and he might have lived. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? You remember, David wouldn't touch Saul. He said he's the Lord's anointed. It's well sometime to see things from God's viewpoint. And as long as King Saul was king, David said, I won't touch him. No one else better touch him because God is the one who put the crown on him and God is the one who will take it all when the time come and David would not touch him. And you know that it's a dangerous thing today, friends, to interfere with God's work in many ways. I could tell you some very interesting stories about some folk that have attempted to interfere with God's work, God's program, and God's man. And God moves in and judges today. He's always done it. David said here to him, Weren't you afraid to stretch forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of his young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. Now David judged this Amalekite. Now listen to David. David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, if this man made that story up and made this confession, it certainly was a fatal thing that he did. And David says, if you have lied to me, then your blood's upon you because you confess that you kill the Lord's anointed. I'm of the opinion that he really had done that. But be that as it may, this Amalekite is judged. He did what David would never have done. David would never have touched King Saul. Now, David's grief is revealed here, and friends, it's genuine grief. David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And this is quite a very moving thing. Also, he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it's written in the book of Jasher. Listen to this now. Saul had taught Israel something. He'd made really a contribution. You see, these people had no weapons of war. We've seen that. No iron weapons. Saul had taught them to be bowmen. That is, taught them to use the bow and the arrow. And that was quite a weapon, by the way. Many of our ancestors would testify to that were they here today. That's what the Indians used to hold them back and win many battles, by the way. And here is this lamentation. It really is a thing of beauty, by the way. And here's real grief and sorrow. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. That's the capital of the Philistines. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. That's in the Gaza Strip. That's still in Philistine country lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, and that's up in the north where the battle was fought, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, 
for there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. And you could not say that either Saul or Jonathan were cowards. And after all, Jonathan and David were bosom friends. They loved each other. And David's grief is sincere. Listen to this. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel, and he had brought prosperity to that land, you see. Now listen to this, and here is a real note and touch of grief. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. By the way, that's quite interesting. And I'll tell you why it's interesting. Because David was married to the sister of Jonathan. And she actually, as we'll see a little later, she betrays him. I think she loved him as a hero at the beginning. There came the day when she despised him. And this man, David, was not too successful in his love affairs. As we have said, Abigail is the only noble woman that I find in his retinue. And I disagree with those who think Bathsheba is so outstanding. I don't think so. Someone says, well, it was David's sin. It was, absolutely. And God judged him for it, as we're going to see. But let's understand one thing. What was she doing out on the roof parading around like that? May I say to you that it's David's sin. We're not trying to apologize for him, but we are trying to say that David was not successful in his love affairs. And as a result, he could say of Jonathan that here was a man who was true and loyal to me unto death. And the interesting thing about David, though many of the women were unfaithful to him, the men that were his followers were loyal to David to death. He had that charisma that some men have of having followers that will stick with him. And David was that type of a man. Now, the last verse says, How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? This, my friend, is a tremendous tribute to Jonathan in particular, as you can see. And David's grief over the death, particularly of Jonathan, is touching, and it's poetic, and it's dramatic, and it's one of the most striking lamentations that we have in the Word of God. Now we're going to see next time David is made king over Judah. And Abner, who was captain of Saul, he made Ishbosheth Saul's son. Now, not all of Saul's sons had been killed, though all of them that were in the battle were killed. But this was a younger boy. And Abner made him king over the remaining 11 tribes. And, of course, civil war broke out. And David defeated Abner and the army. And we find that after a long civil war that weakened the nation, David finally became king of all of the 12 tribes. And we'll find that he made Hebron his home at first until finally he moved up to the place that he loved above all others, Mount Zion. That's where his palace was ultimately built. And we're going to follow David now through this particular section of the Word of God. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The death of Saul is not the end of David's troubles. Find out more next time.
To continue our study of the life of David this weekend, you can join me for a never-before-aired sermon, Bathsheba was not involved in David's greatest sin. Listen online at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find a station. Today's study is always available, free to stream or download, thanks to the generous and faithful investments from your fellow Bible bus travelers. Just go to ttb.org or download our app to listen again anytime. As always, we'd love to know what's God teaching you. 